It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to our tutorial session, Self-Supervised Learning in Recommend System. And I'm Dr. Hong Li from the University of Queensland. Uh, currently, I'm leading the largest recommendation team in Australia. Uh, the other two speakers, uh, Mr. Jun Liao Yu and Dr. Tung Chen, are also from the University of Queensland, uh, my research team. Uh, in this tutorial, we will first introduce the background and the history of self-supervised recommendation. And then we will overview uh, the taxonomy of self-supervised recommendation. And then uh, we will talk about the data organization uh, techniques and the various self-supervised recommendation methods include uh, the contrastive learning, generative learning, predictive learning, and hybrid methods. And at the end of the tutorial, we will discuss about the limitation of existing self-supervised recommendation methods and point out the future research direction. And it's not possible to cover all the research topics and uh, methods on self-supervised recommendation. So we have released a survey paper and a library. So if you are interested in this emerging area, uh, please find the link uh, in the chat we will uh, post the link for this survey and our library in the chat. And so if you have any question, um, uh, you have two ways to ask a question. You can uh, post your question in the chat or ask a question using the microphone uh, in the last 10 minutes. Now, let's get started and uh, okay. Uh, we'll introduce the background and uh, the history of self-supervised recommendation. Okay, can you share uh, your screen? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so just wanted to do a quick uh, video and audio check for all the online audience. Um, yeah, just wanna make sure uh, everyone can hear me okay and clearly see the slides. Yeah, very um, good, very good. Yeah, the background and history should be showing up right now. Okay, great. Um, so uh, Rocky Chen here from the University of Queensland. Um, thanks, Professor Ng, for the uh, opening talk and the introduction. And now we just want to kick things off with a bit of background and history about both the recommender systems and also its, um, you know, um, um, collaboration with the self-supervised learning technique. So let's get started. First thing first, why recommendation? Um, as you know, typical online users within the computer science community, I think most of us are experiencing the fact that we're now just living in an era of information explosion. And sometimes we just call this information overload. And for online users, that just mean it's getting harder and harder for the users to really get the information we want and harder and harder to get the information relevant to us. And this is where the recommender systems come into play because the systems can simply help discover your potential interests based on your previous interaction records and your profile. And with the discovered interests, they will be able to recommend the relevant items, products, or services to you. Long story short, the recommender systems simply ease the way of decision making for different online users. So uh, the recommender systems is a very well developed research area and has been devel developed for around you know, 20, 30 or, or even more uh, decades. So there are a lot of different model architectures for recommender systems, and we are not getting into too much details about that. That's out of the scope of today's talk. So let's just take a look at a very generic neural architecture for recommendation uh, taken from the typical neural collaborative filtering. The input we have here for the recommender systems uh, are user features and also item features. Um, sometimes we can have very high quality raw features, uh, but sometimes we just use their IDs as the input features. 
And with that input into the model, we have some embedding layers, uh, mapping them to a latent space. And then we are gonna build some deep layers um, upon it. With that, we are gonna generate some embeddings, which are the vector representations for both users and items. And with those vectors, we can essentially compute the similarity between users and items. And with that, we can do some ranking tasks. With the ranking generated, we can further use some ranking-based objective functions to optimize the models. To optimize the model, the, aim, the ultimate goal is usually obtain high quality representations or those embeddings. And a very key factor here is we need the availability of historical interaction data. Uh, between users and items. And with that, we can do some proper back propagation and obtain high quality representations and then use the learning um, representations to compute the item scores and do the recommendation afterwards. However, we need the availability of user item interaction, but we are facing a long standing problem in the research community for recommender systems which is the data sparsity. So long story short, most users just can only consume a tiny fraction of uh, countless items. And this leads to the fact that for a lot of open source benchmark data sets currently around uh, within the recommendation domain, we usually see a sparsity of over 99.9%. That is very sparse. By which I mean, for most of the user item combinations that's possible within the data set, we have no labels for them at all. So we don't know the item, um, you know, uh, the user's attitude towards that item, whether the user has accepted or rejected the, the item, or what's the rating score given by the user to that item. We don't know that. And what we have is only a tiny fraction of available observations between the users and items. And the question here is usually how to generate satisfactory recommendations with very sparse interactions. So this is a long-standing question being asked in the um, recommendation research community. So um, here is actually where the self-supervised uh, learning technique shines because it really fits the purpose well of addressing the you know, uh, data sparsity issues with recommended systems. So first thing first, what is it? So what is self-supervised learning? So it is a typical type of representation learning technique, which enables a model to learn high quality data representation from unlabeled data. And this is great. It fits the purpose of addressing data sparsity well in recommended systems. So why do we need it? We know that data acquisition in recommender systems is costly and simply put very hard because the data can only be generated by users themselves. That means for any unobserved the user item um, pairs, we cannot make decisions for the user, whether the user likes it or not. We cannot do that. We can only rely on those data generated by the users, those uh, available feedbacks to train the model. So with the help of self-supervised learning, it becomes more and more feasible for us to learn good representation. And those uh, make the model easier to transfer useful information hiding in the unlabeled data to the recommendation. So this is a very desirable feature. To quickly show you uh, the working mechanism of self-supervised learning, we have prepared a quick comparison between the traditional self-supervised learning workflow and also the self-supervised um, the, uh, the self learning workflow. Here is the supervised learning workflow. After collecting abundant original data, we will pass that on to some human annotators in order to give labels to the training data. And only through this way, we can obtain high quality training data samples that are fed into the model. 
And then the model generates and learns the representation through some training task. And we're done here. But things will look a bit different with the self-supervised learning. And the key difference here, as we can tell, um, is after getting the original data, we no longer have the huge performance and data availability bottleneck of the labor intensive manual annotation process. But instead, we have a predefined data augmentation method strategy. And with that, we can generate, instead of labels, the to do labels, maybe some side tasks, or maybe some other ways uh, we can, you know, uh, define the data. And with those augmented data, we input into whatever model we are using. And then we can learn some high quality representations by defining some self-supervised task losses. With the representation learned, we will be able to transfer those information to the downstream tasks. Um, sometimes we directly use this uh, for other purposes. Sometimes we will be able to fine tune it to obtain better performance in other tasks. And the principle of the self-supervised learning is, like I said, well aligned with recommender systems needs for more annotated data. Because um, for all the unobserved user item interactions, these are just unlabeled data. Previously, we have no ways to deal with them, but now with the help of self-supervised learning, things are looking better for us. And to incorporate self-supervised learning in recommendation, we are generally following three essential features. First thing is that we want to obtain more supervision signals by semi-automatically exploiting the raw data itself. And secondly, we want to define some meaningful um, pretext tasks to train or pre-train the recommendation model with the augmented data. And thirdly, because it is still ultimately a recommendation framework. So the recommendation task is the unique primary task and the pretext the task plays a secondary role to enhance the recommendation. So it is used as a kind of reinforcement strategy for learning the representations here. And a bit um, information about the development history of self-supervised recommendation. It actually dates back to you know, 2016, where we sometimes see the autoencoder-based models. And the self-supervised task is usually to do a bit of reconstruction of the user item rating matrix. And as time goes on, uh, the generated adversarial network becomes popular. In the 17, we're seeing some GAN-based models, uh, which uses the generator to generate some augmented data points and usually have a discriminator to distinguish the source of the data. And in the 18, uh, we are actually seeing a blooming research field within the network embedding using um, network you know, graph neural networks. So this is why we're seeing more self-supervised recommendation using network embedding based models. And as we enter 2019, uh, we have a bar chart of uh, the number of papers published in the domain of self-supervised recommendation. We can really see things are starting to grow. So in the 19, um, there are some self-supervised learning, you know, going on. And the, the topic itself actually becomes an independent concept in the machine learning community. So very prospective there. As we can see from the bar chart, uh, and when we enter 2020 and 2021, there is really an explosive growth within the amount of publications about self-supervised recommendation. So we are seeing more and more complex models, including this BERT-based ones. Now the 2022, uh, the number of paper is uh, low, but just remember, we are just four months into 
this year, 2022. And we believe there must be an upward trend in the amount of papers published about self-supervised recommendation. So uh, let's get on to the second part, because we see from the history that self-supervised recommendation has already been developed for four or five years. And there are definitely a lot of variations for these kind of methods. Now it's time to do a quick taxonomy and categorization of those different variants. And I will guide you through it. First thing first, let's uh, have a quick browsing of the basic design ethos behind the self-supervised recommendation. Let's see the basic architecture of it. Usually we have two major components, the encoder and the projection head. So the encoder is usually um, used to map the raw data into some latent representations. And the projection head usually follows the encoder. It takes the latent representations and maps them to the desired output for whatever tasks we have designed for it. And in order to optimize those two components, F and G, we usually input the original data alongside the augmented data into the encoder first, then the projection head. And with some predefined loss function, we will be able to minimize the loss, thus optimizing the encoder and the projection head. And in terms of the definition of the loss uh, when doing uh, the self-supervised recommendation, it is usually two parts, okay? First part is the self-supervised task, sometimes called the pretext the task. And uh, the second part uh, is always the core part. We need to have a proper recommendation loss to be combined uh, in the final objective. So uh, as I said, there are different variations for the self-supervised recommendation systems. And uh, uh, our tutorial also is also associated with a uh, survey paper we have just released. And among those over 60 papers about self-supervised recommendation we reviewed, this is the statistics about four major categories of the self-supervised learning techniques used in those recommendation papers. And as we can see, taking over 40%, the majority um, or the most popular variation, that's contrastive learning. And we put it here on the left-hand side contrastive learning. And we can see there are some more subcategories under each big branch. And Mr. Junglian will be talking more in that a bit later. And we can see from the pie chart, uh, taking the second and third position, we have the generative and also the predictive methods. And these are uh, summarized in our taxonomy. And as we are seeing more and more complex tasks and the more and more larger scale data sets, we are witnessing the development of some hybrid models. As the name suggests, the hybrid model usually combines two or even more different variants from those categories. And more about uh, an overarching view of each of the category. First thing is the contrastive methods. And we can have some implications from the name already. So if we are having some contrast, we need to augment the data in uh, several different ways. In this example, we can augment the data, the same data points into two different views. A very typical example is, for example, uh, if we are just using the image data set, uh, we can have an image of an apple from one uh, angle, and we can have the image of the same apple from a different angle. These are two different views, but the object is ultimately similar. And the goal we want to achieve here is that we want to pull the views of the same instance closer in the embedding space. So we can push the views of different inst um, instances apart at the same time. And this is the fundamental for contrastive learning. And the second thing we have here is the generative methods. 
So as we can see from uh, the flow chart, it works differently with the contrastive ones. And uh, in order to do the generated methods, we still need the augmented data, but this time we actually augment the data by corrupting it. So one good typical example is if you can recall how the language model BERT is pre-trained, right? One typical pre-training strategy for BERT is to let the model actually predict some masked words in a long sentence. And this is exactly what we can do as well uh, in the recommendation literature. So if we have a sequence of interacted items, we can let the model to predict some you know, uh, masked item. Uh, we remove some items beforehand, we let the models to predict them. And uh, it's a kind of reconstruction. So comparing the generated reconstructed data with the original data, we can calculate the self-supervision loss and do the optimization. And the third category, predictive methods. And as the name suggests, we are doing some other predictions alongside of the original recommendation task. And the workflow is just like this. Uh, we need to generate some augmented labels, sometimes called to do labels. And these labels uh, usually represent a kind of task which is closely associated with the core recommendation task. Okay. So the head now will be asked to predict those to do labels. For example, what's the in, um, interacted item uh, prior to the one in the sequence? It's a kind of very typical to do label. And by comparing the CDU label and the predicted labels, we can also define some kinds of self-supervision losses and get the optimization done. And now, as I said, we are having more and more hybrid methods coming. So these will essentially combine those previous categories I just introduced. And they will produce definitely different self-supervision losses now we usually use a weighted sum uh, and just in order to combine those different loss functions, then we can do the training. Uh, as since we just talked about training, uh, some quick context about the typical training schemes. The mostly or the you know very commonly used ones is the joint training. These are especially popular in the contrastive methods. Because uh, the losses from both the recommendation and the self-supervision are joined together, just like this, we sometimes use a damping factor alpha to control the magnitude of self-supervision signals. And with this combined loss, um, the representations will be optimized with two tasks at the same time. The other strategy is the pre-training and fine-tuning, okay? Uh, a quick note here is that it is very popular in generated methods, and we've seen a few instances in contrasting methods as well. So the pre-training, usually that's a two-stage process. So we first optimize and learn the representations with self-supervision loss, the pre-train stage. And with the pre-trained representation, we further fine tune it by uh, defining some recommendation tasks. The third strategy, <coughs> sorry, the third strategy um, is called the integrated learning. That's mainly used by the sudo labels um, with predictive methods. Because uh, the thing is, those to do labels in predictive methods usually have very well designed subtasks that are highly aligned to the core recommendation task. For example, predicting the category of the item the user will interact. And in this occasion, um, it makes a lot of sense to simply combine the losses from both the self supervision and also the recommendation. So these are just unified into an integrated objective. And here is the distribution, uh, the percentage 
of three different pre-training schemes used in all the literatures we have reviewed. And we can see uh, integrated learning is still gaining popularity, but not as popular as the previous two I just introduced. So as we enter the third part about data augmentation, um, I will be handing this talk over to uh, Mr. Jun Liang, uh, and he will be carrying us onto the following sections. So uh, Jun Liang, are you there? Yes, I'm going to share my screen. So thank you, Rocky. Yeah, thanks. So let's get us started, shall we? Well, data augmentation techniques actually plays a very important role in self-supervised learning. So before detailing the self-supervised recommendation methods, we first introduce some commonly used data augmentation techniques. So as you may know, data augmentation increases the amount of training data by creating plausible variations of existing data. And this generated data can be used as the input or the labels and in self-supervised recommendation, the most commonly used data augmentation approaches can be uh, divided into three categories, including graph-based, sequence-based, and uh, feature-based. We make this category because uh, in, recommendation, in recommendation scenarios, the user interaction data is often modeled as uh, a bipartite graph or, uh, or a set of sequences. And sometimes for the users and items, there are associated features. Okay, let's first see the graph-based documentations. Uh, as you know, users and items and their interactions are often modeled as a bipartite graph. So we can see the original graph, there are two types of lows, a green one and the uh, blue one. And we can consider uh, the blue one as users and the green one as items. And as for the graph-based documentation methods, the most popular one is dropout. And in the graph, we often drop out ages or loads, and uh, it operates in a way that with a certain probability, each age or load will be removed from the graph. And the idea behind this type of uh, dropout is that we think any partial collections or loads are informative to the quality load representations. And uh, it's easy to understand because in recommender systems, uh, there are mainly noisy data. For example, you can uh, click an item out of curious. So uh, actually this data may not contribute to the final performance. So we just, we, by uh, dropping these uh, useless edges or loads, we can learn quality representations. And the way formulate this uh, process of dropout by these uh, equations and where the uh, G-tiered and the A-tiered below to the uh, augmented graph and the uh, agency metrics. And here we use a vector M uh, in which only, uh, which only contains zeros or ones to mask the age or to drop the age or the loads. And uh, in addition to the dropout, and uh, we also have a method named graph diffusion, which is opposite to the dropout based method. The diffusion based augmentation is Adds, uh, adds edges into the graph to create views. Idea behind that, uh, there are mainly uh, unobservable user behaviors which are po actually positive and uh, we cannot observe that. So if we can uh, use some methods to find out these edges and then add them into the graph, we can create a useful graph conditions. And we usually discover the possible edges by calculating the similarities of the users and item representations, and then we retain the edges with top case similarities. And here we can see the formulation we just need to add an edge set to the original edge set. And similarly, we can use another method named subgraph sampling to create uh, graph conditions. It samples a portion of loads and edges by rules to form some graphs. The idea behind it is that we think the sampled graph 
reflects the local collectivity and the semantics. And uh, given the sample node set, they, and we can use this formulation to, uh, to formulate this process. And actually, a lot of approach, approaches can be used to induce subgraphs uh, like MetaParse, guided Randworks, and the Eagle Network Circuit. Uh, for example, in social network, we believe that the Eagle Network of a given user uh, may share similar preference with a given user. So if they can, uh, if the Eagle Network can be sampled to, uh, to be of an augmentation of the uh, subgraph, we think it would be very useful to infer the user's preference. And uh, besides the graph and in recommended systems, the user item interactions can often be modeled as a set of sequences. And uh, in the uh, sequence, which contains the interacted items, and they are sorted uh, in, in the time order. And the, uh, we, the goal of, in the sequential recommendation is to predict the next item. So uh, there are also a lot of augmentation op approaches can be used to generate or to augment sequence data. And uh, allegiance to the word masking in BERT and uh, the researchers developed item masking, which randomly masks a portion of items and replace, uh, replaces items with special tokens mask. So the idea behind it is that the user's intention is relatively stable during a period of, of time. So uh, we can mask part of the items and then use the rest to infer the primary intent. And here we can see given the uh, indices of the masked items, uh, we replace the items with the uh, mask token, then we learn representations for the mask for the token, and then we use the token to predict the masked items. And this augmentation method is often used in generative uh, tasks. And uh, the other one is iter cropping, and uh, which it also borrows from borrowed from uh, tasks in NLP and the computer vision. And in this method, we can crop a subsequency with a certain length from a given sequence. And the, the selected subsequence is expected to indulge the model with the ability to learn generalized representations without a full user profile. And we can say we can use, uh, given a probability, we can uh, compute the length and then we crop uh, a subsequence with a given length. And uh, besides, we can also shuffle the items, uh, shuffle sub, a continuous subsequence to create uh, same stock conditions. The idea behind is that uh, actually we often assume that items in a sequence, uh, the item order is very strict, but actually many external uh, factors can impact the order. So actually different order item orders may correspond to the same user intent. So we can uh, shuffle the uh, subsequence, but the, uh, we get an, uh, get a new sequence which actually corresponds to the same user intent. And these three augmentation methods can be used to uh, augment the long sequences. But uh, when it comes to the short sequence, which only has uh, several items, using these methods may exaggerate the data sparsity issue. So uh, we can use another augmentation methods, which are often considered more robust to augment the sequence data. And actually we can uh, substitute items in short sequences or insert uh, items in short sequences. And uh, these items are, are often are usually highly correlated, correlated to items, which means they are similar to the replaced items. And uh, here we can usually these items are computed by uh, representations, uh, by representation similarities. And then we can use these items to augment to the short sequences. And uh, in recognition systems, users and items are often associated with features, for example, uh, like the user profile, ages, uh, gender, and uh, uh, any other information and these information can often be uh, used in recommended systems. So we can also augment this feature data to 
uh, to get more self exploration signals. And uh, let's just do the age dropout and item masking in other two scenarios. We can also drop features to create augmentations. And uh, the idea behind is that the whole information uh, can be inferred by a portion of features. And here we can generate a matrix M by Berkeley distribution and then we apply this matrix to the original feature to get augmentations. And another way is feature shuffling. Uh, we can switch rows and colors in the feature matrix to augment the data. And uh, the idea behind it is that by randomly changing the contextual information, the feature matrix is corrupted to yield augmentations. And here we can see the uh, formulation. There are two permutation matrix, which means uh, in the permutation matrix for uh, for one row of one color, there are there is only a single entry that is uh, one and the others are zero rows. And this augmentation method is often used to generate negative samples. Uh, okay, let's see the next. And uh, besides the two methods, we can use feature mixing, uh, which means it makes the original features with uh, features from other users' items or previous versions to synthesize as inform informative, negative, or positive uh, examples. And, uh, you can say the equation will actually uh, interpolate to interpolate to representations to get a new one, and uh, this one is often used as a hard negative or positive samples of the original one. And uh, besides, we can also use unsupervised methods like clustering to augment the feature. And uh, usually we assume that there are prototypes in the feature representation space and uh, user and items, uh, each of user or item may belong to one or several clusters prototypes. So they should, they should be closer to their assigned prototypes. So we can use clustering algorithms to generate, to learn the prototypes and then we can use the augmented cluster label. And, uh, uh, this method is often used in uh, contrastive methods. So after uh, introducing the augmentation methods, let's come to the most important important uh, part, self-supervised methods. I think most of you may be interested in how we apply self-supervised learning to uh, recognition. And uh, just as Rocky has introduced, uh, there are four types of uh, methods in self-supervised recommendation. And we first see how contrastive methods work in the, in the scenario of recommendation. And according to where the self-supervision signal come from, we divide them into three categories, structure level contrast, feature level contrast, and model level contrast. And for each subcategory, we uh, present some representative methods and the first, let's say uh, the structure level contrast, we uh, subdivide the structure level contrast into two subcategories, including uh, the same scale contrast and the cross scale contrast. For the same scale contrast, uh, two additive actually comes from, uh, actually at the same scale, for example, in the local to local contrast, we actually contrast two loads and uh, we consider load can reflect the local information of the graph. And uh, besides the local to local contrast, we also have global to global contrast uh, where we consider each sequence as uh, each sequence can reflect the global information. And uh, by contrasting these uh, two, uh, two sequences from a global view, we can uh, refine the representation. And besides the same scale contrast, we can say we can also contrast the local information with the global information. And in this type of contrast, uh, the load is, or the or, or, uh, or a pair of loads are considered as a local information, while the whole graph is considered the uh, global information. Uh, besides, we also have local to context contrast. Uh, we are 
the subgraph is considered as the context of a load. And here we can see we can also see some equations and the loss estimates the mutual information between the uh, two entities in the contrast and uh, the process as uh, the goal of the uh, learning is to maximize uh, the mutual information between these the contrasted two entities. And we first say the structure level contrast and here we choose uh, SGL which was published in last year CIR as a representative method. And in this method, we can say there are uh, two type of tasks and it actually adopt, adopts the joint learning pair uh, training scheme. And so we have a recommendation task and a contrastive learning task. And uh, given the original graph structure, uh, SGL first augment the graph by applying edge dropout, load dropout, or land work. And the land work can be considered as a multi-layer edge dropout. And as it gets to augmented views, the contrast uh, the two views through the info NCE loss, which usually is presented in a sample soft to max for, and uh, then by jointly optimizing these two tasks, and uh, SGO can uh, generate accurate recommendations. And then let's say the uh, global to global contrast. And here we choose the cl for SREC as a representative method. And the, the process in this method is very similar to the process in SGL, given the original behavior sequence. The method first uh, to augment the sequences through uh, augmentation operators like uh, item shuffling or item cropping. Then we the, the method contrasts these two augmented sequences and uh, you, by using a uh, contrastive loss and it actually uses the info NCE loss. And uh, we can see in this method, the contrastive law, uh, the contrastive task and the recommendation task uh, share an encoder. And uh, then let's see the global to local to global contrast. And the, in this method, uh, the given pair of loads, uh, which means we have one user and one item, they are considered as a pair of loads. And uh, this pair reflects the local information and uh, then the method BIGI wants to maximize the, the mutual information between the, the pair of loads and the whole graph. And here it creates negative samples by crafting the graph with uh, a dropout. And uh, in this method, the cross entropy is used as a contrastive loss. Actually, the uh, cross entropy and the influence E loss are the lower bounds of the uh, mutual information. So optimizing the, the cross entropy loss or the influence E loss can uh, indirectly maximize the, the mutual information. And uh, we refer you to the paper named uh, Lura Info neural mutual information estimation for the uh, concrete information of uh, how this losses maximize the mutual information. Oh, by the way, uh, for, the method, for this methods, we uh, present the title of, of them. And so if you are interested in these papers, you can uh, search uh, this paper is in Google Scholar by using the presented type, provided title. As for the local to context contrast, uh, we, we choose a method named NCL, which is published in this year's triple W. And uh, actually, the, this method, the clustering is method, is cl the clustering based augmentation is used. And it considers that similar users' items tend to fall in neighboring embedding space, and their prototypes are the center of clusters that represent a group of semantic labels. And then, after learning the, learning the representations of the clusters, and for each user or item, the is method uh, maximizes the mutual information between the given user or item uh, between 
the given uh, user item and the uh, cluster, corresponding cluster. And then let's move on to the feature level contrast. And uh, as you know, there are abundant features provided for uh, of users and items in the real scenario. So we can, uh, we just, we can uh, conduct contrast between uh, different feature augmentations. And here is a method uh, published by Google and we can see it has a very simple structure and uh, it adopts a two tower structure and uh, one tower is for learning user representations and the other one is responsible, responsible for learning item representations. And uh, given the feature as a input and this method augmented the features by masking or drop out some features. And uh, then we can see uh, these two tasks actually uh, share an encoder and uh, it has uh, a very similar structure with the method of SGL and the CL for SREC. And there is also another line of contrast methods. Uh, I think this uh, type of method contrast is very interesting. And uh, because uh, for the structure level contrast and the feature level contrast, uh, this method actually uh, augment the data, but uh, for the model level contrast, this method actually augment uh, the representations by changing the structure of the model. So we can see in this uh, paper named SRMA, it proposes three types of uh, model level of augmentation for contrast. Uh, first, it can uh, mask some neurons so it can get different representations. Then we can use uh, different representations to conduct uh, contrast. And uh, also it can drop some uh, less important layers and in the uh, FF, FFN. And uh, finally, it can, lastly, it can also use uh, another pre-trained encoder to generate different representations so that it can uh, refine the information. Okay, now let's move on to the generative methods. And uh, as you have low generative methods, reconstruct the original input with the corrupted version. So in the scenario of generative methods, we can actually conduct two types of generation tasks. Uh, the one is structure generation, and the other one is feature, gener feature generation. So uh, first, let's see the structure generation. And uh, first, we present, we present the method of uprec, and it is very similar to BERT. So we can say, given the sequence as the input, this method first mask, uh, mask some uh, a portion of loads, and uh, here we can see the uh, red circle denotes the masked item. Then after uh, learning the representations through the encoder, we need to uh, predict uh, what is the masked item through the equations. We can see uh, this, these are the, uh, of the loss functions. And then we need to find to this this model by predicting the last item of each sequence. So we can say in the pre-training process, we actually can uh, mask the uh, intermediate items. So to uh, predict, but finally to predict the items, we need to find to this model by uh, masking the last item and then predict it. Besides the sequence re uh, reconstruction, this uh, generative methods can also be used in the scenario graph. So in the scenario, we need to generate and reconstruct the graphs. And given the graph, we can uh, mask some edges, then we need to use this corrupted structure to learn representations. And then we need to uh, generate uh, the masked edges 
and this task is used as a pre training task and then they find to the model for downstream tasks, uh, including recommendation. And uh, this method can also be used to generate features as you know, uh, each load has some uh, associative features. So if we can mask, mask the features, then uh, pre-train the encoder to predict the mask feature. And when we just need to fine to the uh, model to um, uh, for the downstream tasks. So you can say the same model can be used in both the graph reconstruction and uh, the feature generation tasks. And the next, next, next is the predictive self-supervised recommendation methods. The predictive methods appear uh, appears to be like the generative methods, but uh, in predictive methods, we actually uh, do not graph the original data, and we generate the supervision signals from the complete original data. And according to what the predictive tasks predict, we uh, they can be categorized into two branches, including sample prediction and the pseudo label uh, prediction. Okay, first, let's see the sample predict prediction uh, based generative predictive methods. And here we choose a as REP as a representative method. And this method includes three process. Uh, first, in the first stage, we uh, per train a transformer in a reverse direction to predict prior items. And then we can, uh, the method uses this transformer to generate fabricated historic items at the beginning of the short sequences. And finally, uh, it fine tunes the transformer using these augmented sequences from the time order to predict the next item. So we can say first, uh, portraying the transformer in a reverse direction. Very interesting idea and then generate uh, the pseudo prior items. Finally, uh, use left to right fine tune to get uh, more accurate recommendations. So in, the sub sub in this branch, the generated uh, samples are then uh, fed to the encoder. So we can say there is a loop uh, we say there is a loop. And so this uh, branch is often connected to uh, semi-supervised semi -supervised learning, especially uh, self-training, which is a special flavor of semi-supervised learning. And besides the sample prediction, we can also train the uh, model to predict the pseudo labels and particularly for the relation prediction, which is commonly used in predictive tasks. Uh, so there are two instances. First, we can say uh, in the sequence scenario, given a sequence, we can shuffle or replace a portion of items in, a, in the sequence. And uh, we need to predict if the modified sequence is in the original order or from the same user. And then in the graph scenarios, uh, this method, method first generate subgraphs uh, subgraphs by metapass based random work uh, random works and then it leads to predict if there uh, exists or uh, meta pass between a pair of loads between a user item pair so we can say right it first generates meta passes and then it leads to predict if there is a meta pass between a pair of uh, loads a user item pair. And uh, in predictive methods, we sometimes uh, need to predict uh, the similarity between two representations. And uh, first, let's say the BUIR method, which actually uh, inspired by the BYOL method in the computer vision. And in this method, it uh, adopts a structure of uh, which consists of an online network and uh, a target network. And the online network is fed with the user representation and is tried, trained to predict item representations output 
by the target network and uh, vice versa. So we can uh, see, and particularly in this method, we need to emphasize that uh, they it just need to update the online encoder and for the target encoder, it stops the gradient flowing and uh, uh, use the uh, moving average method to update uh, the target encoder. Uh, this, this idea is actually never uh, innovated by BYOL and this method borrows uh, this idea. And similarly in Clue, which is published in last year's ICDM, it uses the same idea, but it applies to uh, sequential recommendations. So we can say there are also two networks, uh, very similar structures, and also it applies the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the strategy of stop gradient and use uh, any update, updates one encoder and uh, then using mover, moving average to update the another network. And finally, hybrid methods. Uh, in the last two types of methods, there is only one type of pretext task. And actually, in self-supervised recognition methods, there, you know, there are uh, multiple types of pretext tasks. So, what if we assemble them into one model to take advantage of different uh, self supervision signals? So, uh, oh, sorry, I, there is a mistake. Uh, this should be hybrid. And uh, we can divide the hybrid methods into two uh, branches, including collaborative and independent, according to how different pretext tasks operate. And uh, in the category of collaborative, uh, different pretext tasks collaborate in a way to serve one primary pretext task. And uh, in the uh, category of independent, there are low correlations between different pretext tasks. So they work uh, independently. So let's first say the collaborative methods. Here we use CSL uh, to illustrate how collaborative methods work. And uh, we, in this uh, method, the generative task serves a contrastive task. And it actually has uh, two predictive tasks, one is generative task and the other one is the contrastive task. And it first pre-trains the encoder uh, with the gener uh, Sorry, looks like I, I have run out of the battery I need to a moment, sorry.
Well, um, so Rocky, can you uh, hand over the microphone to me? I'm back. I'm very sorry for the technical issue. Yeah, I'm um, sorry about the technical issue, guys. So uh, I'm just handing over back to Jun Liang. Okay. Oh, so, so let's uh, get back to the independent methods. And in this type of methods, and different predict uh, different predictive tasks work independently. So we can say in this model, we have three uh, predict tasks. One is generative task, and the other two are predictive tasks. So in the we need to uh, predict the masked items. This is a generative task, and while we also need to uh, predict the user attribute and the, the social relation, uh, social relations between users. And uh, we can say these uh, three tasks work independently. They are, uh, they are not related. And after introducing four types of uh, self uh, wise recommendation methods, we need to discuss the pros and cons, and uh, we can say how uh, uh, we are these uh, methods uh, apply. And first, let's see uh, the pros and the cons of uh, contrastive tasks. And uh, its pros are that uh, for the contrastive methods, it is very flexible to design augmentations and uh, pretext tasks. So we can say uh, we have introduced a lot of augmentation methods and uh, they are all static and uh, we can design these occupations by heuristics. But uh, the cons are that uh, this type of methods are often compromised by low quality augmentations. And that because uh, the, uh, the flexibility is the advantage, but uh, sometimes can also be the disadvantage because we do not know uh, which augmentations are high quality. So, uh, if the, our intuitions are not relevant to the recommendation task, we can we may generate low quality augmentations. So the model uh, would be compromised. And the, for the generative methods, it's, uh, the pros are that we can follow the successful experience for training mask language models. We can see the generative methods, especially for the sequence uh, scenario, scenario are very similar to the uh, mask language models like BERT. So we can just uh, use their experience and they have paved the way for the generative uh, self-supervised rec recognition models. But the cause are that when, uh, when we want to build general purpose models, which means we lead a huge architecture, then we may, confront it, we may be confronted with heavy computation uh, because as you know, it's uh, very time consuming to train uh, large scale uh, models like BERT and for some groups which has uh, have very limited resources, uh, they, they cannot train such, model, such big models. And for the predictive methods, the pros are that uh, the, this type of methods can generate uh, samples and pseudo labels in more dynamic and the flexible, flexible ways, uh, as you can say, in generative or contrastive methods, we generate augmentations in a static way. Uh, but uh, sometimes with the uh, model training per setting, we, uh, these augmentations may not be informative. So if we can generate dynamic samples or pseudo labels, uh, then they may be more informative to the training. But uh, we also need to consider the, uh, the cons because uh, in this type of methods, collect the zero labels based on heuristics, which means uh, we do not know how relevant these labels and uh, predict, uh, predictive tasks to recognition, uh, which means they may be they may have a negative impact on the recognition performance. And finally, for the hybrid methods. Uh, its advantage is that it can get enhanced and comprehensive self-supervision signals. 
But uh, the disadvantage is that it may be confronted with a problem of correlating multiple pretext tasks, uh, particularly in the uh, branch of independent methods. We can say we have uh, multiple types of pretext tasks, but uh, we do not know which one is more important and which one is less important. So we may be confronted with the problem of coordinating multiple pretext tasks, and we may need some uh, prior knowledge or expert knowledge to uh, coordinate different tasks. And uh, then let's get to go to a part of uh, library. And we notice that although self-supervised recommendation in, is enjoying a period of prosperity, but uh, in the papers of these methods, we notice that the uh, evaluation of different methods are often unfair. And some papers uh, may not release the codes and for the paper which have released the codes, these codes may be inefficient and sometimes hard to read. So uh, to standardize the uh, evaluation and facilitate the empirical comparison and the development of self supervised recommendation, we uh, release a library named self-rec which incorporates multiple high quality data sets and the commonly used metrics. And also there are more than uh, 10 plus state-of-the-art self-supervised recommendation methods implement, implemented in this library. And so you can just use these methods. And uh, also uh, self rec support both uh, TensorFlow and the PyTorch, so, which means most of you can uh, enjoy uh, this library uh, to develop your own method. And uh, also it provides a set of simple and high level interfaces so by which we can, uh, by which new self-supervised recognition methods can be easily added in a plug and play fashion. And finally, it decouples the model design from other procedures like data uh, pre-processing and evaluation. So we just need to pay attention to the logic of the model so, which means uh, the, uh, the, the, the development has been streamlined. And finally, the limitations and future research. Now we have uh, uh, gone through a lot of methods. They are very effective and uh, they have reported very good performances. But there are also some limitations uh, existed in the in these methods. The first one is uh, the theory for augmentation selection, and as you can see, most of the uh, methods presented uh, adopt uh, augmentations by heuristics, which means uh, we need to search for the best augmentations through cumbersome trial and error work. And uh, so if we have a solid recommendation specific theoretic foundation for the augmentation selection, we can uh, use it to guide the process of data augmentation. Uh, so we can, uh, these methods can, self supervised recommendation methods can be more useful, especially for the contrastive methods. And in the area of computer vision, there have been some theories that can uh, guide this process. But in recommendation, what is the criterion for the augmentation selection? There, uh, there <coughs> currently, there hasn't been a uh, theory for augmentation selection in recommendation. So it is urgently needed. And besides, uh, we also pay attention to the attacking and defending in pre-trained the recommendation models. We, think, we believe uh, this direction uh, will be very promising uh, because uh, attacking and defending recommendation models is very important. As you know, there are very uh, many types of attacks that can uh, manipulate the results of the recommendation models uh, where the attackers can benefit from the manipulated results. So uh, currently we have known that recommendation systems uh, especially the self-supervised recommendation systems are vulnerable to the data porting attacks, uh, which means the user, the attack, attackers can inject managers user profiles 
to the data, then the trained model will ge uh, generate uh, re uh, results uh, which are beneficial to the attacker. But for the um, unsupervised, especially the self-supervised recommendation models, it remains unknown if the models were trained in these ways, in these ways are robust to such attacks. So we think developing new type attacks and defending self-supervised pre-trained recommender systems against this, against this, these attacks will be an interesting future research direction. And uh, the third future direction, uh, I believe, is undivided self-supervised recommendation. And uh, now undivided machine learning uh, is becoming more and more popular uh, because undivided machine learning has advantages of low latency and uh, privacy preserving. So for recommender systems, these two advantages are very important. Uh, uh, the users, uh, the, they think they are Privacy, uh, their privacy can be protected, and they also want to enjoy low latency services. So there is a trend to move recommender systems to on device, uh, to 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 edge devices such as smartphones. But for these uh, uh, devices, they have very limited uh, computing resources. So uh, employing uh, recommendation models to this devices are challenging. So if how about uh, so if we can combine uh, the self combine self supervised learning with uh, techniques such as logic distillation, then we employ uh, employs these techniques to uh, on device uh, to, to edge devices, uh, we think we can heavily greatly improve the uh, performance of the on device recommendation models. And currently, undivided self supervised recommendation is still underexplored, and uh, we think it deserves further study. And we also have a very recent work, which is published in this year's CGR, uh, which is uh, which focuses on this topic. So, if you are interested in how self supervised learning applies to undivided recommendation, you can uh, refer to this paper. And finally, uh, we lead to work towards general purpose virtually. Currently, the recommendation, recommendation models mostly focus on, uh, on a single recommendation task. For example, recommendation movies, uh, recommend movies or recommend uh, music or uh, goods. But uh, in the real scenarios, there are actually uh, multi-model data for example, like text, audio, video, image. So if we can use this model model data to train a, a large model with, towards general purpose, uh, which means it can be used to uh, can be used for mainly downstream tasks. So this is a very promising and important important future direction. And uh, finally. <coughs> As you can see, because the time is tight, uh, we can only introduce very limited information about self-supervised recognition. So if you are very interested in this topic, you can refer to our recent survey on self-supervised recommendation. And uh, this survey covers all the information presented in this tutorial. And uh, you can also find something, the, the other things interesting, such as uh, the contrastive loss And finally, uh, it's time for the question and the answer. We have 10 minutes left. So if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to put forward. Any questions? So Junlian, um, while we are uh, waiting for the questions to come, uh, I think uh, as you 
you know, have dived very deep into the self-supervised recommendation research. Um, can you, you know, will you be able to provide our audience with some advice on, you know, when to choose different training mechanisms? So because sometimes we can use pre-training and fine-tuning, but sometimes we just use joint training. So in what situations, um, which training mechanism will be more suitable? Oh, so, okay. Well, actually there is no guidelines for the choosing for the selection of uh, different trading schemes. Sometimes the per trading method may be uh, uh, better, but sometimes the joint learning paradigm may be better. And uh, in terms of the papers I have read, uh, I, I haven't seen any criteria for the uh, selection of these trading schemes. And I think it's based on the uh, concrete scenario. And uh, we also need to uh, find out which one is the best through uh, trial and error. So uh, although it is, uh, you know, uh, cumbersome, but uh, there is no better way. So that's why I uh, didn't present uh, this uh, this content in this tutorial because we uh, do not have uh, the policy, the strategy to choose which uh, in which scenario we should apply uh, which trading scheme. Yeah, I would uh, really agree with your comment. So you know the the choice of training methods that's highly based on heuristics so far um, in self-supervised learning based recommendation. Uh, I think that might be a potential area to explore more. Yes, I totally agree with you. And also we should uh, be noticed that uh, actually in some methods, uh, some data augmentations, which used to be considered uh, useful, actually may have elective compact. So it's very important to find a solid theoretic foundation for the selection of data augmentations, also the training scheme. Uh, sometimes the heuristics or the intuition uh, may not, uh, may, may be not aligned with uh, uh, the, the, the reality. So, is a direction worth exploring. Yeah, it's true. Um, so I think we are seeing more and more um, uh, auto machine learning for a lot of recommendation tasks. And I think it will be a really interesting case to see its combination with different data augmentation techniques because essentially the different data augmentation techniques can be viewed as some hyperparameters within a, a, a recommender system. So, you know, instead of purely design that with our heuristics, we can probably do that in an automatic way. Yes, uh, that's cool. Uh, but uh, I think it would be very hard and actually, uh, in different fields, including computer vision or uh, NLP, I have uh, seen there are very few works that combine automa automa automation learning with uh, self-supervised self -supervised learning. So that's why I did present this direction as the promising future uh, direct research direction. And uh, also people may currently may do not know how to combine them. And uh, I also think it's very challenging, but promising. So if someone can uh, figure out the way to combine them, I, I think that would be very great. And uh, so. Yes, yeah, yeah, that, that's a challenge. You should, yeah, it's really hard to design the search space. If we want to combine the Auto machine learning with self supervised learning for recognition. So we, we need to design the, the search space for the 
uh, augmentation. But at this moment, it's not it's not clear. It's not clear. Yeah. Um, so another, I think another issue is you know most of the several supervised recommendation method mainly focus on the recommendation accuracy or recommendation effectiveness, but they ignore the recommendation efficiency or model training efficiency. Although you know several supervised learning. Uh, somehow can improve the recommendation accuracy, they can address the data stability problem. But at the same time, there is no free lunch. We, it also bring extra time cost. So do you have any idea how to uh, trade off, make a good trade off between the training efficiency and the recommendation accuracy? Oh, uh, so actually in our recent work, we have developed a very simple uh, self-supervised method for uh, graph-based recommendation. And I think uh, the key point is that we first need to figure out uh, which part is important and uh, which, which part is necessary. So actually many self-supervised recommendation methods, they uh, design based on heuristics. So some parts may actually be user is or, or not necessary. So uh, if we can figure out which one uh, actually plays the important role you know, and the removes the less important part, you know, we can develop a very effective method. So if uh, for some someone who are yeah, there is one question. I recommend you to uh, yeah yeah yeah. Do I, I think I, yeah you you I think you can post the, our recent paper in the chat. So that uh, others may uh, interested in this work, and there is a, one question. Uh, can you see it in the chat? Okay. So, the question is: How can we avoid the sort of bias? Yes, the bias. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Maybe, yes. By data augmentation. Well, actually, in recommend assistance, as you know, there are uh, many types of bias, such as popularity bias and selection bias and so on. And uh, actually the popular bias is, uh, is, a, is the biggest problem we are facing because uh, for a good recommender assistance, we need to recommend the long tail items instead of popular items because uh, people can get information of the popular items from uh, many other ways. So if a, a recommender assistance always recommend the popular items, people may think this recommended system is not a good one. And uh, so, uh, I, I, well, actually, uh, there are very few papers that address this problem, but uh, our recent paper uh, made me uh, enter the, the, the name of the paper in the chat box. For I think this is a very interesting problem. Um, I think for this problem, we need to first uh, investigate what kind of bears can be introduced when we do the data augmentation. Yeah, yeah. And then based on the specific type of the bears, we can design uh, the, the, the method to de bears. Yeah. And if uh, let's get back to the question. And uh, actually, some augmentations such as dropout may exacerbate the popularity bias. So uh, actually, and in our recent paper, and this paper is published by this year, CIGAR, we find a way to uh, de bias, and especially we can mitigate the popularity uh, bias. So if you are interested in this topic, and if you want to know how self-supervised learning can address the bias issue, you can refer to this paper as we use a very simple method to address the popularity bias. And uh, we can, the, and the, in this method, the, it has achieved very great performance and the uh, performance gains uh, all, come, all come from the long tail items and the, our method uh, is inclined to recommend the, Long-term items instead of popular items. So, I think this paper is very interesting and it's simple and effective. It is 
effective. Okay. I think it's, it's time to end yeah, our tutorial time. session, right? So, so thanks everybody for your patience and uh, for your uh, attendance. So if you, you have still so have any question, uh, please send an email to me or to Junliang or to Rocky. Yes, welcome to drop me an email if you have if you are interested in this topic and want to have further discussion. So I will respond to you at my earliest convenience. Uh, also, if you can uh, follow or start our project, we will release the code and update the library uh, regularly. So if, I hope you can uh, find something useful from our tutorial and the release library. Also, you can refer to the, our survey for more information. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for attending this tutorial.